I could also maybe write a story where it's like God comes and says, you're the new God, you know? And then that I seems God, like so much know? responsibility. Well, you know, I'd be God, so it wouldn't be that hard, <laughs> you know? You just heard from Colin Amore talking a little bit about how he would not shy away from the responsibility of being God because he could handle it because he would be God. <laughs> would you be able to handle that, Alyssa? No, I can't handle being <laughs> Alyssa. Not interested. I will not apply. No one's asking either. <laughs> so that's fine. I'm we're fine with it. <laughs> we're going to hear more from Cullen later. He was in here uh, just about a month ago and sat down and was gracious enough to talk to us in the murder closet. Thank you for that, Cullen. Thanks, Cullen. So you have that to look forward to later in the episode. But first, we bring you an interview with Emily and Bree from Taco Cat. But wait, we didn't introduce ourselves. Oh, right. We didn't introduce ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I am the ever forgetful Arwen Nix here with the ever mindful Alyssa Atkins. Oh, hello. <laughs> but anyway, that business out of the way. Right. More importantly, we're about to hear from Taco Cat. Yes. An exciting story from Taco Cat. Yeah. I think. I agree. I think they would agree too. I hope so. I hope they like it. I know that Brie listens. She keeps asking me, when is my episode of the Sub Pop Podcast? Hey, Brie. Here it is. <laughs> So Emily and Brie were kind enough to meet up with me on a weekend, just a few blocks from my house. And I went over to Emily's apartment and she made snacks and we talked about how cute raccoons are and, you know, uh, raccoons again, again, raccoons. I was in a real, you know, sometimes I'm in a porn phase, sometimes in a raccoon phase. Never the two shall Never mix. the twain shall meet, I <laughs> yeah. swear. Um, oh, my dad listens to this. Alyssa, come on. But <laughs> anyway, so after talking about cute raccoons, we sat down in her breakfast nook and had snacks and coffee and talked about what it's like when you're contacted by Cartoon Network to make the theme song for a really popular cartoon, this one. Powerpuff Girls. All right. How did this whole thing first come about? We got an email from a lawyer at Cartoon Network, and it was like, hey, we think your stuff is really neat. Um, would you guys be maybe interested in working with us on the new Powerpuff Girl theme song? And then I think I've never answered an email so fast in my life. No, he didn't even say email me. Like He's like, call me. And I called him like one <laughs> second later. And I'm like, is this a joke? <laughs> and like Googled his email. And I was like, oh my God, he actually works at Cartoon Network. This isn't a mean prank. He was just kind of like, so write a song. And I was like, this can't be how this is going to work. And then we were all in the basement of our practice space, like, like growling, and just like, ah, this is so, what do we do? Yeah, so we did some weird song that we just made up and wrote the lyrics to and everything. We sent it to them. The lawyer guy was like, this is great. I'm drinking brandy right now. Yeah. And we were like, great. And then they were, they were like, you totally beat out the other three people we asked to do this. And we were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know you asked three other people to do it. Yeah. And then we went, we got moved to the next level. It's like a video game. Level two is like, actually, we wrote a song for you to do? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like the song already had like vocals, lyrics, all of it. So I was like, so... We were under the impression we had to do something like it, but not. they were like, we want it to be more like this. And we were At like, first I was like, why aren't they just using this then? But then we had like a couple conference calls and then, but I mean, it's like, it has to be exactly the same time, which is where we were having trouble because we're not really like a studio musicianship kind of band. Like Lila wasn't playing to a click track. We were literally recording it in the living room of Spruce House, which is where 75% uh, of Taco Cat lives. So we gave it a, Sloppy shot. Because there was also a time a, yeah. thing where they're like, it needs to be done next week. So we sent that in and then. It's like self recording. And then <laughs> at that point, they were like, we're going to send the composer up that did it. We're going to fly him up to Seattle.
he's like, so what do you guys record? And we're like, in our living room. He's like, oh, no. <laughs> it was really funny. The composer was really, he's really so sweet. so sweet. But he um, is used to working with, you know, real, like we're a punk band, and he was used to working with, you know, studio musicians. And he writes, like, video. And he built video. the first song himself with, like, different devices. Yeah. So he's used to, like, because he's a composer for, like, video games and stuff. So, yeah, he was not quite ready for how, for we, just how professional we, we are. <laughs> he handed us like all sheet music and me and Eric looked at each other and just started sweating and we were like, we don't know how to read that at all. The and handing he was, like, out of the sheet music was one of my favorite like, moments of our whole oh career. <laughs> and we all, we were like, we can't read that. And he was like, oh, and then he was like, okay, okay, scrap the sheet music. We're gonna figure this out. Me and Eric both like tried to learn exactly how he had written it, but it's like too hard for us. Like it's like walking bass lines and shredding layers of guitars, but and, like stadium drums are just like doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we were like, we can't do that, but we can do Ramon's drums and then dumb down this bass line yeah. to be only the root notes, and and then we've got a couple, you know, we can do it, and we spent like three or four days just. 15 hour days. Yeah, figuring out a good compromise. And it was like hard work. It was like the hardest I've ever worked at like anything musically. And it turned out really cool. It's like not final mixes yet, but the last time that I heard the mix was really good. Yeah. So how is that whole process different than the process you just <laughs> finished recording your most recent record? All our songwriting for that is just so um, more natural. It's just like, we like come up with ways to play things and I think the thing that we work a lot on is revising it. Like we're like, oh, we need to cut how long this verse is or something. Like it's just like kind of we like feel it out instead of it being like so structured and stuff. Just mm -hmm. kind of more intuitive to like how we play music. Yeah. Did it change anything about your process? Like having this experience with the theme song for the Powerpuff Girls, did it like were you like, oh, we can approach this this way, or did it maybe on the other side, like just kind of reinforce, like that's not how we do things? Maybe, maybe a little bit. You know, this was the first time we've ever recorded our tracks separately. We like, I've never recorded my bass separate from like Eric and Lila. We always track everything live, and then add Emily's vocals right after. Um, and this was kind of a pre-cursor to like how we recorded things with Eric Blood because mm -hmm. he had us record like that. So it was kind of good studio experience since we don't have a lot of it. And like Leela doing the click track type stuff. Yeah, that was definitely the most pro thing we've ever done. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, doing everything separately this time was a little bit of a baby step in that direction. Yeah. I thought it was cool doing everything separately this time. I mean, I'm always separated out, so it's not really was much different for me, but uh, I thought it was really neat to watch just like Leela going for it and getting moved into like different chambers for her drums and then like watching you play along or just as like building a little like taco cat house with all the different parts. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like, <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> That was Emily and Brie of Taco Cat. You did not hear from Leela and Eric of Taco Cat in that <laughs> interview, but you can see a picture of those two as prom dates. Oh, you can and should. Yeah, at subpop.fm. It is so cute. And I, I'm i going to go ahead and say that everyone in Taco Cat is a candy-loving angel, and <laughs> I adore them. 
and three of the four members live at Spruce House, which we talked about in the last episode of the Sub Pop Podcast. That's excellent. Yeah. And prom photos, just the kind of bonus content you can count on us for. Making Seattle connections, bringing yeah. you embarrassing photos. It's yeah. great. Come to us at sub, no, visit us <laughs> at subhop.fm. But first, another place while you're surfing the web, <laughs> surfers, <laughs> head on over to the Mega Mart. And if that doesn't convince you, maybe this Stuart Fletcher ad will. Take it away, Stuart. <laughs> You know the cinematic cliche of the person pushing the baby stroller into the street and like a car is coming? I don't think they push the stroller into the street. I think the stroller, like someone lets go or it falls. I don't think it's like... Oh no, I'm... That too, but there's a... Like a bad guy? Like pushing a baby into oncoming traffic? No, this would be in a movie where this is like mostly extraneous to the plot. Um, say there's two cops, Starsky and Hutch, right. like somehow observing this scene. Turner and Hooch. Yeah. One of those is a dog, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Say they're on a stakeout and like they've been there all night and now it's morning and there's a person pushing a baby stroller. The person pushing the stroller doesn't realize that a uh, car is coming. They're just like oblivious to it. Mm-hmm. Maybe they've been up all night too. Sure. Um, and so the cops, of course, are like, oh, oh my, oh my God, you know, we have to stop this. There's a baby that's going to get hit by a car and this person is oblivious. Right. And so, you know, the tension ramps up and stuff. Um, the car hits the stroller and you're like, oh my God. But immediately you realize it's just full of aluminum cans. And it's like, it's, so, it's just cans. It was only cans, you know? Yeah. That same sense of relief is what you get from buying a Sub Pop logo t-shirt at the Mega Mart. <laughs> <laughs> Up next we have um, our interview with Cullen Omari, mm-hmm. uh, formerly of the Chicago band Smith Westerns, which he started, I believe, when he was in high school. That's correct, right? Yeah, he was in high school. He was really young when that first record came out um, to critical acclaim. And we talked a lot about him going on tour and what it was like to have like success at that young age and what it was like to really have music be the only thing that he's ever felt enveloped by, mm-hmm. which comes up in this interview. Uh, but we didn't start there. We started with accessories. Recently, within the past year and a half or so, I was cleaning out um, some of the boxes in my house or something. And um, I had one from when I was younger, and there was a lanyard in it. And it like it was a lanyard that said, like, yeah, baby, yeah, like an Austin Powers themed one <laughs> that I had from years ago. And so I put it on my keys and kind of was like, oh, I'll just, I'll just have it around. It's funny. But within the first week or two, I realized that having the lanyard was probably lanyard was probably one of the best um, decisions I've ever made. Why? Because you one, it makes your keys so big that you can't forget them. <laughs> two, I don't ever wear it around my neck. I usually just hold it and like swing it around while I'm walking. So it like gives you something to do, and like you just like you know swing it around, and you could I guess you could hit someone if like they attacked you or something. It's one of those things that I think also looks cool because it's just something that you don't you don't wear. And yeah. now a lot of people like us like our age wear them, you know. Yeah. But now now that they're gonna hear this. Yeah, now, gonna, now, yeah. You're really gonna set gonna, the trend. Everyone, I'm gonna have to burn it. So if you had a typewriter and anything you wrote on it could come into mm-hmm. fruition, like what comes to mind like what do you want to do first well i would first like you know try to get a good amount of money um because you know that but can... would you have like a way or would money just appear well i would probably just like write in like i have um like a really enterprising stockbroker friend i give him like five dollars and he's so good he can turn that five dollars into like <laughs> 10 billion in a day and because he's just like so he's just so smart so i get the money and then I think after the money, I, I don't really need the typewriter because, I mean, the, <laughs> the money just works just as well, you know? So if you had a time machine, 
would you choose if you could only go one way if you could only go forward or backward in time which direction would you want to go and where would you want to go to yeah i mean that's hard i mean probably not no later than the last 100 years i mean i'd probably go back to the 60s or 70s because um, i feel like musically I'm, i have the most affinity with that time period i would um try to make my own music there and then never could and I would just like remember some old songs and, and make, <laughs> them right be, yeah, make them be, yeah. <laughs> so what era 60s and 70s are we talking about like who are you running with I'd probably go to London hang out with like David Bowie and Mark Boland then yeah and then I would kind of maybe like chill with them and segue into like kind of the Roxy music era okay and then I would um basically finding a trajectory like David Bowie from you know Ziggy Stardust up to the Berlin era and then just kind of really enjoy the 80s, you know? Hang out with, like, Brooke, like Dave Brooke Shields. <laughs> when it comes to people mislabeling your stuff, which I imagine is annoying, but, like, at the end of the day for you, does that matter? I think for me, there's... There's me, and then there's my music. It's they're, they're the same thing, you know. And I think I derive a lot of my self worth from how my music is perceived, and who who likes it, and who listens to it, and how how it does. So even you know, I'm fine with someone criticizing it, but if the, the way they criticize it is in a way that doesn't make any sense, or they're coming from some angle that they obviously don't get it. And also, I think that, you know, right now I get that there's so much stuff out there that when you listen to something, you just want to listen to the first 15, 20 seconds of it. And if it doesn't click, it doesn't click and you move on. But a lot of the music I've grown up listening to, a lot of the music I, I respect the most is, is immediate, but at the same time, it takes a while to fully, you know, ingest it. That seems like a really vulnerable place to exist like oh yeah having it yourself sucks. like the music like you are the music and like you're so mm -hmm. intertwined with it especially now that like you're doing this thing on your own yeah yeah so you're just like how do you navigate that like if people are being shitty to you like even on the internet it still cuts so like what do you do i think now um that i've been doing it for a while since the one smith westerns record that came out that that did well was like 2011 or something, so now we're like five years removed from that. I feel like I've been able to kind of just, I guess, deal with it a little bit better. Do you ever engage? No, no. I mean, I think, so, you know, one thing I've learned from, from doing is, you know, when you engage the trolls or, you know, you try to start fighting with some writer, a music writer or something, it just comes off looking bad on you. Yeah. You know, um, you know I'm still, you know, wrapped up in the music and how it's perceived and how, you know, everything like that. But I also think that, you know, I don't care as much. People are hungry for a narrative, and that's something that is true in, in mainstream media and in, in pop music and, and is true in, in indie music as much as I think people like to think it's not, you know? There's also a certain amount, I think, of, you know, crafting an image, yeah. you know? What's a line of conversation or something that like you don't get to express usually? One of the things I guess I could talk about that I never get asked about is kind of being half Asian or being you know an Asian American, which is definitely a different experience than you know kind of most of my other indie peers or whatever. Sure. I think some of my detractors kind of look at me as you know, um, from stuff I've done in the past and acting cocky as happening through you know a white male kind of lens or whatever when I guess my experience overall is even though I'm only half a lot of, you know growing up you're seen you know or at least I was when I was in school as being Asian so I think my experience as an I guess adult or as a growing up was through an Asian like an Asian male kind of um, experience like you're getting painted as like having this like white male privilege but that's not the experience that you've yeah, lived yeah so well like I feel like I feel like when I came out earlier on you know we were caught we were cocky so it came off as like they're rich kids. They're like these, like, you know, like we're like the strokes or something. Like we went to the Upper East Side, you know, school or, or whatever, went to boarding school, which, which isn't the case, you know what I mean? It's one of those things where I feel like most of the stereotypes of Asians, like you're just a nerd, you know, there's no kind of like 
cool stereotype. You know, it's not like, um, you know, there's a ton of Asians in music or, you know, it, there's not a lot of, there's no Asian leading men or whatever. Colin Omari, you can find his debut sub pop album out March 18th. New Misery. Yeah, on the Mega Mart. Go get it. Yes. Um, and find out more about Cullen at subpop.fm or follow him on Twitter. You can also follow us on Twitter. Won't you please? We are at Sub Pop Podcast on Twitter, tweeting, tweeting responding, away. wanting to know what you want to hear on the Sub Pop Podcast. We are listening, so find us there. You can also find us on Facebook, the Sub Pop Podcast. You'll see more examples of the lovely art from each of our episodes and conversation starters galore. Yes. Find us there. Extra pictures and videos and links to things you didn't even know you wanted to see but can't look away from. Yep. And then next week, what may or may not be on episode seven? Eight. Eight. <laughs> this is oh, episode li- seven. Oh, okay. <laughs> Next week, what might we be hearing? We may be hearing from Kristen Control, who I spoke to recently. Uh, and we may also be hearing from Jen Champion, who I also spoke to recently. <laughs> One of those two people was in a movie with Lemmy. I'm not going to give away who, but we do talk about that. And the other one did yoga in front of me as part of the interview. Can I- you guess which one is which? Because <laughs> I don't know how to stretch and they were helping me out. Oh, that's very helpful. Yeah, something called child's pose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't know. Now you do. Now I do. Thanks to this mystery guest. That Thank will you, be revealed mystery guest, whichever one time. you are. Thanks also to Emily and Bree of Taco Cat and Colin Omari. We really appreciate your time. Yes, thank you talents. so much. This week, you heard music yes. on the Sub Pop podcast from Colin Omari, Taco Cat, Don Gibson, and of course, Mud Honey. Thanks, Mud Honey. And thanks also to the Sub Pop Brass DJ CJ Ease My Mind, Chris Jacobs, <laughs> Megan Jasper, and Jonathan Poneman. Thank you. Thanks, guys.
indefatigable 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 indefatigable